Hello, welcome to Visual Radio. It's Friday night. Visual Radio Live. Is my collar okay? I think it is. Visual Radio Live. I got my hair cut. I got a shave. I'm all ready for my show. It's um, Friday the 13th. My godfather, Frank, was born on this day. He's no longer with us. My cat, Fluffinutter, died 20 years ago today. God bless Fluffinutter. God bless Godfather Frankie. Tonight, we've got New York Times writer Matt Richtel calling in from the left coast. Any second now, in fact, and he has a new book out. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Oh, that looks cool. Joe LaRocca did such a fine job on this. It looks great. Jeff Dearman's producing tonight. And we've got all sorts of great stuff to talk about. We've got a, we got a, um, a lot of guests tonight. We have Eric Casaccio calling in about Freak. He's a film director. His movie is Freak, Plus One Productions. He'll be calling in from L.A. He was born in Malden. So we'll be talking to Matt Richtel first, then Johnny Byers will phone in with the Boston Red Sox report. And Eric will phone in, and then Frank Delastrito, and tonight, Night of the Living Dead. And I heard the phone ring. Someone grabbed it. Oh, that's a cool profile. I like that. Uh, yep. Oh, well. Anyway, here we go. Hello, you're on visual radio. Didn't get through, huh? Got a fax line? Oh, uh, try 781, if you don't mind, Matt. 721. 2050. Thanks. Hey guys, we're going to call in on the regular line. He got a fax line. Yeah. Okay, and we're not getting that line either. You know what? I'm going to call him. Or just call him. Yeah. Well, let me. Hello. Hello, Matt. Okay, he's going to call you real quick. All right, so, so go ahead and hang up. Hi, it's Matt Richter with the New York Times. <laughs> okay. My apologies, Matt. Uh, it happens. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But uh, we changed the phone lines last week. Now we changed them back. Out of my control. No, there are higher deities than, than us, and they are technology-related. I've only been doing this 31 years. I don't know how you've been doing it a long time. You're a Pulitzer Prize winner. These things happen. These things happen. Hey, uh, what did you win the Pulitzer Prize for? Uh, being handsome. Wow. That is not true. That is a totally lie. My late wife would be right through the phone lines if that were true. <laughs> I, uh, I won it for a series on distracted driving, the risks of multitasking behind the wheel. It was a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting last year, 2010. And that is now uh, an explosive epidemic. It is not. Uh, it does not seem to be slowing down. All the polls show that while people are terrified of others, texting and talking behind the wheel, they are perfectly happy to do it themselves. So, interesting little disconnect there. It is, and it's illegal in Massachusetts to text. Okay, is that right? I don't know. I can't remember all the states. Uh, we'll talk about the devil's plate thing. I'll tell you one funny story. There was a fellow in front of my house. We're right on the corner of a main street. In his suit and tie, a young guy in his 20s, and he's obviously texting. And the cops were doing a drug bust, so I just said, hey, man, across the street, all those cops, they're pulling people over for texting. He stopped. <laughs> it was great. It's just perfect timing. There you go. You, you, are, uh, you are a citizen at large. Yeah, there was some kind of pot bust going down, and, you know, the whole Medford Police Corps. I live in Medford, the next town over from here. The whole Medford Police Corps is out, you know, for whatever, some pot bust, and 
Hey, you know, I just fit. It worked. Devil's Sorry. play thing. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just, you know, it's hard when you're not in front of me here, Matt. I, I am in spirit. But you're, you're always welcome in our studio if you can survive. Gilbert Gottfried just did. Uh, that I cannot follow. <laughs> I cannot, you want me to, you want me to sh scream or shriek? You know, uh, he was on The View one day, and then he ended up here. And I said, it's a long way down. <laughs> there are others who would think of it the other direction. But you've got a little tour coming up, I see. Uh, but it's mostly California. It's, it's California. It's uh, Phoenix. It's Colorado. Um, uh, yes. And back to California. And back to California. Right to Napa, where you'll probably do wine tasting with the book. Oh, I will do. Yes. No. I mean, I. You can assume I will be drunk during all readings. Oh, during all readings. No, that's not true. I just saw Napa Valley, so I figured you'd be having fun. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna try to have fun. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna give myself a sobriety test, and I will not read unless I pass it. You don't read and drive, do you? I do not read and drive. Okay, just wondering. I don't drink and drive, text and drive. I do not read and drive. I do sing and drive. Okay, I do too. But so far, uh, there's no research on that. Well, on June 14th, the uh, Devil's Play thing will be at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Yes. Is that, a, um, is that one of those mystery bookstores? It's one of those mystery bookstores, and they've been quite gracious. They, they actually have a press, and they printed a... Uh, short hardback run of Devil's Play thing to go along with the big mass market uh, fancy pants everywhere version. You're kidding. It's true. How many like, copies? Oh, I don't know, 5,000 or something, just a hardback alone. Um, evidently, they're mystery, mystery fans are big, uh, they're big collectors, and they want to get, they want to get in on, um, they like, they like, one, they like collecting first runs, and two, they, they, apparently, they like to, um, get the first runs of people who may someday be big and uh you know they should have gotten gilbert godfrey's i don't know if mine will gilbert the level gilbert's funny i'm glad he was here but his book at certain points is a great read at certain other points it's a tough read in what respect well he's not an author and he just got a book deal because he's gilbert godfrey so he just started writing yeah and so, like any good joke, there's some great humor, great timing, and then there's stuff that just kind of goes flat. <laughs> and, but that's okay. You know, it, it, it works. It, he's a I funny mean, man. You could, I guess you kind of know what you're getting if you buy his book, you know, if you're a fan. Right. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's, you know, it's, it's not meant to be serious. Um, but Archer Mayer has been a frequent guest on this show. Uh, he's on Mystery Books. Yep. And we had a bookstore here called Kate's Mystery Books in Cambridge. I think she's closed. What a marvelous little shop it was, though. Is that right? So, yeah, so you're going to be in, in, on this little tour. It, it's obvious to me just from the titles of these, some of these stores, Books Passage and Tattered Cover Bookstore. I mean, I want to go to all of these just to see the bookstores. They are, these are, I mean, Book Passage and Tattered Cover are among the, are among the most wonderful, extraordinary bookstores. You know, this, I mean, there's this, there are these stalwart independent bookstores that are that are hanging on and remaining kind of centerpieces of the community. Um, but man, competition is tough. You got the big old Amazon out there, and and even eBay and uh, the, I had a guest um, copies of my of a book that's not yet out being sold on eBay. Your your book? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not exactly sure how it works. Well, it's the they, PR. They have some sort of time-space continuum where they go backwards, time, and they can or forwards and get my book and then resell it on eBay at a discount. Well, sometimes there are there are misprintings. You know this, and um, and they have piles of books they're going to throw away. Yeah. And they don't get thrown away. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, because uh, book, you know, that it's just what happens. But when did you start writing? And is it, how many books have you put out? Is this your first? So this is my second book. You want to hear? You want to hear? Uh, you want to hear? Uh, uh, I, what I would? I, what I hope might be a compelling story of how a of how a fiction writer was born. Sure, absolutely. All right. So I was, I was a, uh, a New York Times reporter. I am a New York Times reporter. I never aspired to write a book. That many words seemed 
daunting, if not uh, slightly crazy to string together into one lucid thing. And, and I sat down at a cafe in probably 2004, and I wrote the following basically page and a half. Guy sitting at a cafe, he, uh, but, you know, about my mid-30s, uh, he's reading a book. He sees a beautiful woman's hand put a note on his table. This uh-huh. is the story I write. This is the page I write to myself. And he, by the time he looks up for the woman, she's gone. And so he picks up the note to follow her, and he opens the note at the door of the cafe, and it says, get out of the cafe now, and the cafe explodes. And he's sitting in the rubble outside having survived, and he... Uh, and, and he's thinking about his ex-girlfriend who died four years earlier. He's always been obsessed with her memory ever since she died, but that's not why he's looking at her handwriting at this moment. I mean, that's not, why he's looking, look, that's not why he's thinking of her right now. It's because he recognizes her handwriting on the note. So I write this, and I go, i got to figure out what happened here. I don't know why I wrote it. I don't know what captivated me. Five months later, a book was born. It became Hooked, and it was a, a bestseller, and we had some nice success. And then that same main character is now the character in the second book. I, I really got the fiction bug, and uh, and he's he's in Devil's Plaything now. Very cool, and I appreciate that story. And I'm sorry I've been you know, I should have done more background, and I'm sorry I didn't. But thank you for bringing us up to speed. <laughs> no, I mean that, uh, no, I'm. Uh, I'm a a wee guppy in this literary world, so there's no reason anyone ought to know that. Um, Um, But, uh, yeah, now he is, uh, is, I don't know, shall I ramble on? Well, yeah, because you incorporate your uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, story into the fiction, is that correct? I do. I mean, I've been covering how technology affects our lives um, and our brains and our behavior. You know, as a technology reporter, I haven't been really been the guy who says, ooh, there's a new iPad out there. I've been, uh, I wrote about distracted driving. I've written about the science behind how heavy technology use affects your brain and its, its addictive powers and um, some, of the, some of what it does to attention. We did a series last year called Your Brain on Computers. And apropos of that, uh, just a, a slice of what this book is, our, that same main character, his name is Nat Idol, has a grandmother named Lane. And she has um, she is suffering severe dementia, and she knows an extraordinary secret. But not only does she not know what that secret is, she doesn't even know she knows a secret because of her her um, Alzheimer's. And as a conspiracy begins to befall the family, uh, our main character Nat Idol realizes he's got to elicit this secret from her before something terrible happens. And it's it's. It, it does, the conspiracy does ultimately relate to much of the stuff that I have written about uh, revolving around tech, heavy use of technology, but also is a, real, is a story about something I see both as journalist and human these days, and that's our aging population and how we're dealing with these tough issues. These are tough issues. You dedicate the book to your grandparents. Is that all four grandparents? You know, it is all four grandparents. Uh, remarkably enough, given that I'm in my early 40s, Three are still alive, um, and and the one who passed, my paternal grandfather, I was incredibly close to, and uh, I you know I've, I I kind of see uh, I used to carry I used to carry a quote around in my wallet. This is going to make me sound a lot more uh, erudite than I am, but it, it was something from uh, like John Adams, and I, I never got the quote exactly right, but it said, "Be soldiers and politicians, so your children." can be lawyers, doctors, and business people, so their children can be artists, poets, uh, painters, and, and writers. And I always thought, you know, the first generations really get things built and the foundation built, and the next ones maybe build a little wealth, and the last ones go seek for truth. And, uh, and so, you know, thanks to my grandparents, they built a foundation that years later I could be a writer. And that's an amazing story. Um, Fact. My paternal grandpa, they, he made them name me after him. And well, it, it is our roots, Matt, you know, it's our roots. These and are our roots, yes. I have a writer coming in, Richard Panic, with the 4% universe. So it's interesting, you talk about the technology, but everyone's on this mad quest for more space, what is dark matter. Um, it's on everyone's mind. 
mean, more space meaning how, how do you mean? Well, the universe, looking into the universe and taking your telescopes and your Hubble and looking out there. And, yep. and you're talking about technology in your book, and, and everything's very, everything is tech today. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we are, we are using, the, the statistics are extraordinary about how much more technology we can, how much more media we consume than we ever did. And um, there's, there's, at least from the stuff that I've been doing, there is a, there is a nascent but still um, not insubstantial body of work that says when you are constantly attached to your devices, your head's on a swivel, your uh, you're, you're not always focused, um, it's coming at a performance cost, and, um, and, and I, think, I think to some extent we have, it, we have swallowed our use of technology whole without, a, without always thinking about the side effects. And, and again, that's, that's part of the, the conspiracy in, in Devil's Play thing. But when I was writing as a wee lad back in 1969 with the typewriter, uh, it was a lot less... Uh, flexible. Yeah. You know, I, I put that you'd be here on Twitter and on Facebook. And back then, I used to have to pop letters in the mail, or in the 70s, and even in the 80s, I'd pop letters in the mail, and they'd get there the next day. And I was really a master of it, but uh, it was a lot of work and a lot of stamps. Well, yeah, I mean, I should be very clear. I mean, I, I'm certainly not a Luddite, and, and I don't, um, if I'm even using that term correctly, and, but I'm, I'm not anti-technology and the stuff I cover that I write about for the Times and that I write about in these, in, in these thrillers is not anti-technology, but it, it is a little bit of a reality check about the extent to which we consume technology, and I really like the way an ex your point about how how valuable technology is i really like the way some researchers have put it to me me matt wearing the journalist hat they say think of technology as food it you know like food um we need technology it is part of the lifeblood of modern existence but they also say um some food is twinkies and some food is just brussels sprouts and we need to start thinking about the fact that some of our technology consumption serves us and some detracts from us and some may have material effects we're not aware of. Start thinking of your digital diet. So for sure, your typewriter was, was an incredible, um, sir, I mean, was, it was, it was, was far less flexible than our, our computers are today. But that doesn't mean you should be, say, uh, texting in the middle of the night or well, you know, driving a bus. You're absolutely right. Um, what I like about Hopper and what they're doing is they still have these paper press releases, which a lot of people have stopped, Matt. And I think you're fortunate that they're sending them out because I collect them, I like them, and it's real. The book is real to me because I'm from the old school. Yeah, you know, there's, there, there's a, I hope that never, I hope that never goes away. There is, I think they are a very tangible um, and, and sort of humanizing Experience to hold a book in your hand. I also can see where uh, where people would say they are fundamentally inefficient. If you can download something with the click of a button, uh, then download it. But but I also think I, I don't know. I'd like to. I'd be curious to know what you think. But I I think there are other kind of psychological reasons to to want a book. One of them is sort of silly and narcissistic. But with a book. People kind of can see what you're reading. In a way, you're declaring something about yourself through the cover of the book. You can also put them on the shelf, and you know you're saying about yourself, I'm a reader and I like books. Um, you know, I, I don't know. There's something kind of ante antiseptic and about the idea that all you would have is one little thing on your shelf that would have a bunch of information inside of it, and everyone would have the same gray-colored Kindle. It's kind of like the Twilight Zone, you know, and... Uh, a book has personality. I like touching it. I like the feel of your book is good. And I like smelling the paper. I'm just an old book freak. I've got there all over the house. I think, I think the, the marketing campaign we should have done for Devil's Play thing was, this book smells good. Well, that, that's one aspect of it. It feels good, too. And it feels, it feels good, and, and it smells great. It is absolutely the Devil's Play thing. And by the author of Hook, see, if I was... Uh, I'm so busy looking at all the other elements of this that I didn't look at the front page. It says author of Hooked, and I would have known. Yes, and, and well, I, and I'm willing to do at any time, I'm willing to do a uh, dramatic reading of one of the blurbs. So you just let me know. 
Cool. You know, you have to come out to the Boston area. There are some great bookstores here. The old Harvard Coop is owned by Barnes & Noble, but it's still the Harvard Coop. And Gilbert hey, uh, went... When I, get, when I get as big as Gilbert Godfrey, you rest assured, my friend. I'll be on your doorstep with, with the best smell, the best smell and paperbacks in the business. Well, you know, we collect them here. You have to, you'll have to sit and autograph them for our, <laughs> well, for our audience. Um, you, you won't get enough of my signature. But when did you get Hooked published? The so Hooked was 2007, and it was, uh, it was a really nifty. I really got incredibly lucky. There was a guy, there's a publishing house called The Twelve that um, is put out one book a year, and it was started by a, a quite extraordinary editor named John Carp. And it was like, they, 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 well, I'm sorry, one book a month, not one book a year. And it was like Christopher Hitchens and Christopher Buckley and John McCain. In fact, uh, I was the third book that they ever launched between Christopher Buckley and John McCain, which, you know, all these huge bestsellers. And so instead of calling them the 12, I used to call them the 11 and a half because I thought I was, you know, uh, uh, one half, half step half down from those folks. So I kind of got off to a pretty lucky start for a uh, for a first time novelist, and you know now we've just we've had good fortune since. Now, Matt, when we have our musician friends on, Ray Manzarek, Felix Cavallari, uh, we ask them the demo that got the deal. How did you get the deal for Hooked? I wrote I wrote the book without showing it to anybody. I mean, if I had if I had advice for artists or aspiring artists, and and uh, probably no one wants mine, but but you know I think doing it for for its own sake first and commercial interest second is is what I would say because the the real stuff is from the heart that you really want and have to do, and I wrote it um, in full before I showed it to anybody, and then I showed it. Uh, to a handful of agents and had uh, incredible reception and got some offers and and uh, I guess I guess uh, when you say the demo there was no demo there was only the finished product. Oh, much like the letter by the box top, so white a shade of pale. They were already done. Doris Troy's just one look. There, it was just what it was. I guess it was just one look. Now I don't want to make it sound that simple because it wasn't. I did some heavy rewriting and. And, and the publisher that ultimately bought it wanted some changes before he committed. But, uh, you know, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess a muse was alive in me, and, uh, and, I, and I let her out good. That's so very cool, and thank you for that. We like that tale because each record deal or each book deal is like a fingerprint. It's different. It's all different how it happens for each artist or author. You know, I, I, I have the impression, I, again, you, you have so many talented people on, and, maybe, and you probably have a much broader view of this than I do, but going back to what I said earlier, it, it seems so much to me that the stuff that, that oftentimes the market rightfully does recognize pa passion and, um, and, and the stuff of real muses rather than merely people who are simply desperate to put a book on the shelves. And, and I would hope that, that publishers, this part's hope, I, I, I'd hope that publishers of music and, and books would gravitate towards people who are doing it because it feels right and for the real passion and for the muse and not merely, you know, in the hopes of having fame. You remember that song, Just One Look? Sure. You want me to sing it? Sure. So, I will not. Oh, okay. The late Doris Troy was a friend of mine, and she was on the show, and uh, she just said she went in and recorded it, and that became the hit, the demo became the hit. Well, she must have felt it in her bones. Oh, she was an amazing, amazing gospel singer. And, you know, she was an executive at Apple Records for the Beatles. Wow. And she sings on Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd, if you if you note. You know, it's Doris Troy Wailing on that record. I, I mean, I know the record, but I didn't know that was her. Did yeah. anyone ever listen to that uh, album, Not Being Stoned? Uh, I don't do drugs, so, um, you know. What? Neither, I, even as I was saying it, neither do I, so I'm actually, I can't make that joke. There's two of us, right? <laughs> there are two of us. However, I do text uh, probably with, with uh, abandon, so I don't know if that counts as a drug these days. Well, you, you bring up a good point, and I'd like to explore it with you further. Um, we've got a jam-packed show tonight. I'd like to have you back on, Matt, if you don't mind. As you wish. Um... No, I'd like to get a little bit more familiar with the story, and, and maybe um, in a few weeks you could talk about the tour a bit, because we love getting updates. 
Hey, you know, I'll, I'll come on. I'll come on any time, and I'm, I'm grateful for the uh, attention. And I, you know, I hope if anyone picks up uh, Devil's Plaything, they it, they get as much pleasure out of reading it as I got writing it. Well, very cool, man. And I really appreciate your time, and, and thanks for putting up with our snafus there at the beginning. <laughs> no problem at all. But uh, you know, I'm going to stay in touch by email. How's that? That, that sounds good. Tell me a little bit about your audience and your show. Well, Visual Radio is 15 years old, uh, 16 years old. I called up Marty Ballin of the Jefferson Airplane, yep. and I said, hey, Marty, I'm going to start a new show. He goes, I'll be in Boston. Find me in a bookstore. I'll be up there for a week. I go, right, I'm going to go looking in the bookstores for Marty Ballin, right? Yep. You know, the founding member of the Jefferson Airplane. Yep. So I call his dad. He gives me the hotel number, and... Marty invites me to the show. I see the Jefferson Starship. And at around 1 in the morning, we kicked off visual radio with a great interview. And then we went down to Connecticut. They let me tape the band. And that was show number one. And then the late Bobby Hebb, who had the song Sunny, hmm. he became a frequent guest. Uh, they became two very close friends of mine. And now you're like guest number 551, something like that. Well, is this my... Uh I really like the casual nature of this. Is this is this is this a good vibe for you? Is this what you're looking for? Oh, you're great. You're great. You're you're, you're uh, you've been visualized. You're you're. Uh, that's why I asked you back. All right. If 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 you weren't fun to talk to, you wouldn't get the invite. Well, listen, I'm happy to do it, and 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 all. I mean, I I I really am grateful for. You know, it's it's. I do this from. I really really do this completely from the heart. I'm in love with doing it, but it's also. I have learned that it's a business, and it is very gratifying to get any kind of support because it's hard as heck to get your name out in the world, you know, um, in, a, in a world filled with white noise. So I, I really appreciate it. Well, these are intriguing concepts you have here in the book, and um, I, I do want to talk to you more. So uh, thanks so much for your time tonight, Matt. Okay, thanks so much. Be well. All right, you too. Bye. Bye. Matt. Rick Tell, what a great guest. We're going to have him back. I get two copies of the book, so if Jeff Dearman wants a copy, he's our producer tonight. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Johnny Byers is going to be calling in any second. Um, look at that. Visual radio. Hello, Joe. Ah. Oh, Hello. Call back, Johnny. Uh, hold on. Um, production snafus tonight. This is not good. This is not good, but that's okay. The fax line went off. How do we get the fax line off when our guests call in? Um, but anyway, we're going to have Richard Panik here. P-A-N-E-K. Did I say that right? Panik. The 4% Universe. And Phil McCoy is going to be my co-host. It's going to happen in May in about a week. About a Next week, 4% Universe Dark Matter. We'll just make a call out. Hello, Joe. The fax line, the, the curse of the fax line, Johnny. Hello, Joe. You hear me? Yes, I do. We, we got to keep it brief because we have Eric Casaccio calling in. Well, I, I usually don't step out of my sports realm, but we got a little entertainment news if you're interested. Oh, go for it. The, the, new ca the new cast member of Two and a Half Men has been picked. Yeah, I just reviewed his movie. Uh, Justin Kutcher. Yep. Demi, Mr. Demi Moore. Very interesting. I think he's leaving Demi for uh, Maria Shriver, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's running off with Demi. What do you think? Arnold and Demi, you like that? Yeah, that was funny. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, so how are the Red Sox? Well, right now it's 2 nothing Red Sox in the fourth. And uh, at one point, uh, Buck Holes was throwing a no-hitter before he gave up a hit. But that's, uh, it was early in the game. So, I mean, it, 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 against the Yankees, you're very lucky if you can get, throw a no-hit ball for any type of uh, length of time in a game against them. Yeah, have you been watching us? Uh, yeah, I've actually been paying attention to you, Ian, paying attention to the game. That guy, Matt Richtel, is great, isn't he? Yep. Pulitzer Prize winner, New York Times author, uh, and keep talking, Johnny. Yep. Um, well, uh, 
was a great interview, and like I, like I said before, uh, you get the, the big names to come in and do interviews with you, whether they be on the phone, or whether someone like Gilbert Godfrey comes into Windcam and sits down with you for an hour and does a show. Uh, but, uh, uh, we talk a little bit sports here, of course, uh, this was a tough week because the Celtics got knocked out of the playoffs, and uh, for that matter, so did the Lakers, and then... From that Lakers game, which was surprising. It was depressing, but at least Iggy Pop was on NPR, you know? I got the new Iggy Pop box okay. set, so that makes things a little better. Interesting stat out of the Lakers series was that final game, which uh, Dallas won. Their bench, the Dallas bench, actually outscored the starters for Dallas 72-42 to 42 in that win. Wow. I've never heard of that happening where the bench outscores the starters. I mean... They held, they held the Lakers bench even even uh, up. Uh, both benches scored the same number of points in that game four, but they, they, out, they, they outscored the, the, the uh, starters. The Dallas bench outscored the starters uh, like a, by a two-to-one margin, two-to-three-to-one margin. I would think that that would happen more often. I would think that the Celtics' uh, secondary would come off the bench, be fresh, and just rock the house, but it didn't happen this year for us. No, not for us or not, not for the Lakers, but I'll tell you, the interesting thing was everyone was questioning whether Doc Rivers was going to be returning next year uh, and what would happen with the big three. And it turns out that Doc made that uh, decision really quick. He signed a, a new three-year deal today with the team. So he'll be back for three more seasons with this team. Johnny, I got the new issue of uh, Entertainment Weekly today in the mail. Yeah. And uh, they've got Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver split, so they got that in a magazine very quickly. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger... Yeah, but to get it in a magazine that quick, and in my mailbox today, uh, I'm very impressed. Ashton Kutcher, I saw that on the news, too, and in the uh, the tweets and all that stuff, uh, because it's instant the, news. The interesting thing on that, as we divert, divide from sports, would be uh, what kind of a character is... Uh, how is his character going to be written into the show? Because basically... Uh, they, they, this, this, according to the entertainment news shows that I saw earlier tonight, this deal came uh, 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 together really quick because next week CBS is uh, presenting its fall schedule to its advertisers. Well, there you go, and uh, Charlie's out in the cold, and you know what? He'll come back. John, we've got Eric calling in from the West Coast. We'll talk to you next week. Oh, 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 one other thing, the blog. What's your blog uh, title? Uh, I will give you that in a minute. It is, I think it's Johnny the Kid. Uh, I will tell you that in a minute. It is, uh, oh, geez, I just have to get into my favorites. Let's see. I looked it up before I came on the air, but that's life. Sports John Talk with Johnny the Kid Byers. I think it's just Sports Talk with Johnny the Kid, or is it Byers? No, it says it's Sports Talk with Johnny the Kid Byers. Put it in Google, people. Sports Talk with Johnny the Kid Byers, and read it and get back to us. John, we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. And that was John Byers. We haven't this. I need five hours. I need five hours, people. Um, we got Night of the Living Dead tonight, and Freak. So Freak is not the 1931 Freaks, which was that horror movie using deformed people in a very uh, exploitive way. But Freak by Eric Casaccio. Sacchio uh, from Malden. He's now in Los Angeles, and this film is out, and we'll be talking to him any second. You know what? Maybe I'll call him because uh, the thing is, we know we have these problems here, so why not? If I can read it right. Got it. Here we go. Hello there. Eric. How you doing? Hey, pronounce your last name for me. Casaccio. I did it right. You did it right. We're on winkcam.org if you're watching, but you don't have to. But I have Freak in my hand, and it's not... The 1931 film. No, it's not. <laughs> was that Todd Browning? What was that? Well, uh, do you know if that was Todd Browning who did the 31 
Freaks, plural. I don't know anything about that film. I've never seen it. Oh, it was I very controversial. I've seen that movie database, but I don't know much about it. Oh, very controversial at the time because he took deformed people, and it was a freak show. It was the, uh, the circus. And so they were, you know, it, it was definitely horrific, and these people allowed themselves to be exploited for a film. But uh, it's definitely worth uh, pulling out of the library or off, off the web, you know, because it's probably out of print. It's probably, I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's, no, it, um, it probably is still copyright control, so get it from a library. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. It sounds very interesting. Oh, yeah, I think it would be uh, good for you because you came up with this concept. When did you come up with the concept of Freak? Well, I wrote the script, uh, I started writing the script in January 20, uh, 2010. And um, I really wanted to tell a story about an individual that looks really, really scary on the outside, but on the inside is very beautiful and just a wonderful creature um, holding on to a thread of life's existence. Um, and with that, I, I developed that concept within less than 20 minutes. And, um, and then I went into pre-production in March of 2010, and we filmed we shot five days in May slash June last year, and we completed the film in September. Who is the freak? His name is Aaron Merkin, who is originally from Winchester, Massachusetts. And, and that's where um, we are. You know that, right? Yeah. Amazing, huh? What's his name? Aaron Merkin. He is wow. wonderful. He is a very incredible actor. Wonderful to work with. Really went there with this with this character. He really was not holding back at all. I am extremely proud of him and honored that I got to direct him in this project. I worked with him several times before, but this project is very intense, and he just really went there and wasn't afraid to go into these um, into these emotions that he had to go into. A dark place, because to me. He came off very angry in the movie, and you say the freak is a lovely person, but I, I saw a very angry and uh, bursting with, like, maybe self-pity at some point. Oh, yeah, I mean, he, he, anger is definitely a part of it for him. Um, he's an individual that's been tortured, you know, throughout his entire life, and that was the primary direction I had for this individual. Um, and he's, again, holding on to the single thread of, life, of life's purpose. And the pressure is on because, as you know, he's up for something really important that he really, really wants. And not only does he want it, he needs it. He really needs it. And um, the pressure of that is where he really starts to lose control of himself. And then within the story, there's a beauty when he finally loses his mind <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, kind of realizes that, you know, it doesn't have to be like this, that life does get better. So, did you film it here or out there? No, I filmed it in Los Angeles in my apartment. Um, I've been here for over 15 and a half years. Whoa. Yeah, yeah I've been here for 15 and a half years, and um, I, I wanted to make a story <coughs> as simple as I could, and I wanted to make it as creative as I could within my own home, inside and outside my own home, and that is you know, what I came up with in the end. Now, as you know, I write for the Malden Observer. Yeah. And I found you on the internet. Yeah. As I went looking around for Malden people, which uh, I know so many Malden people, Eric, that I never had to go looking. I just did it for kind of like the fun of it. Because <laughs> I've got about 10 stories in the queue, of which you're one of them. I know. I was shocked one day. <laughs> I, I noticed it and I said, wow, where is this coming from? And I was, I was like, you know, I thought, thought that was really cool. Well, I, I, you know, that's just kind of it. I think. Instead of calling up people that I know, Norman Greenbaum, Spirit in the Sky. Yeah. You know he's from Malden, right? Uh-huh. But he lives in California. So Norman's been on the show, and, and uh, the band Extreme, Gary Sharon, and yep. Charlie Farron, and Robin Farron, and there's the Monroe families, and the Farron families, and it's all these dynasties of uh, Malden music, Johnny A. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, I found this R&B band, I said, oh, you know, let's put their picture in the paper and let's give them some notoriety. Because why not? Everyone's from Malden, so I have this melting pot in my column, you know? 
but it's fun. Don't you think it's it's good for the readers? Oh, it's excellent. I mean, I you know, it's kind of funny. I, I it's funny when I, I can always point out someone from Massachusetts out here in L.A. in, in a second. I can, for some bizarre reason, I can always narrow it down. And um, you know, and then you hear the accent come out, which I no longer have unless I'm exhausted, and I'm and I start saying "park the car" versus "park the car." And um, park you know, I, the I, car. I have okay. some family in Malden still, um, some cousins that live there. Uh, so you know, when I do go back east twice a year, I get to see them and stuff. Well, did you meet Aaron out here or out there? I met Aaron out here in Los Angeles. Actually, um, I'm a former actor, and I was in a play with him years ago, and um, I actually wrote the script for him in my mind. So that's just complete synchronicity that we're in Winchester and he came from Winchester. Yeah. That's Very funny. interesting. Yeah, because it, um, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what else are you working on right now? I have a, well, right now we're, we're on the festival circuit. We just screened at the Santa Catalina Film Festival, which went really, really well. The audience loved our film. I was very excited. And we're going to be going to Texas next to a festival called Q Cinema, uh, Fort Worth's Lesbian and Gay Film Festival. And then we'll be going to San Diego, Film Out, uh, the Burbank International Film Festival, the other Venice <laughs> Festival. And we're up for a ton more. So right now we're just concentrating on the festival market. And I also have a pilot that I wrote um, that I am having two producers look at right now for opinion purposes that I'm trying to shop around now. Um, and that's uh, a pilot that I wrote. I've written it over 10 years ago, and I've revised it a million times. And now it's like time to get this thing out there, especially now because it, the storyline is very prevalent to today's issues. Is it a pilot for television? It's a pilot for television. I, I would consider it a pilot for Showtime or HBO at this point. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, uh, de definitely on the level of, of, of that kind of uh, audience. Um, and so we're going to be doing a table read in the fall to sort of hear the dialogue out loud and kind of go from there. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, you know, you're on the circuit. You're the second director I've interviewed this week. I interviewed Mike Mills on Monday. He has this new movie, and it's going into the gay and lesbian festivals uh, because Christopher Plummer plays his father. Oh, wonderful. Who, who comes out of the closet at the age of 75. And it's a What's real... What's that film? Beginners. Beginners. Do you know what festivals it's screening at? No, but it's a major motion picture coming out in a month. Ewan McGregor plays Oliver, who's actually the um, alter ego, if you will, of the director. The director wrote it based on his life but as he told me in the interview he drew a line in the sand and didn't go over that line but uh christopher Plummer and and ewan mcgregor play the father son in this and it's fascinating and i'm hoping it breaks out to a, a major audience but it it's so artistic it's so wonderful i'm hoping it just doesn't stay in one community you know yeah i mean it's the thing I'm really excited about with my film is that it's it's crossed over from it's gone it's playing in all kinds of festivals it's it's playing in gay and lesbian film festivals it's playing in um, reg, you know uh, the Santa Catalina Film Festival the Burbank International Film Festival which, which are not primarily focused on gay and lesbian content and I love the fact that I made a movie that is going in both markets um, and it's getting a diversity. And um, some people, you know, I, I thought in the beginning I was making a gay film, but I, I really don't, when I look at it now and I look at what the subtext of the story really is, and I look at, you know, you have a man that dresses up as a woman who likes other men, uh, and that's, you know, that's, what, that's where you can categorize it as a gay film, but I think it's, it goes beyond that, which I'm really excited about. Interesting. Now, how long is the movie? The movie is, the exact running time of the film is 18 minutes and 31 seconds. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the film itself is about 16 minutes, and the credits, you know, the opening and the credits at the end stretch it out a little longer. So. Now, would you think of putting together an anthology of, say, like five shorts? Well, I have, I've written, um, a, a couple of years ago I started writing a memoir, and um, what I realized within the memoir, I'm actually, I've, what I'm writing is, big monologues, not a memoir. And um, there is a short, there is a, um, a chapter of that memoir that I really want to turn into a short film. Um, something that personally happened to me when I was in fifth grade, 
that I, I think is a very uh, relevant story for today's issues with gay teens or kids being bullied. I was bullied a lot growing up, and um, which has made me a very strong individual as an adult. And I'm, I'm, I look at that and I say, you know what? I, I'm, a very, I'm a very strong person, and, and because of all that, I've become very strong. Um, and I'm, that what do, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Exactly, exactly, and. You know, I really, I think it's important to tell these stories, especially with what's been going on in the world today. I'm a, I'm a you know, I think the It's the it Gets Better, the it Gets Better campaign with the Trevor Project is a huge, huge, important aspect of life that I wish was around when I was a kid. So, you know, I'm really, the stories I like to tell are the ones that are, where the main character is an underdog um, that's just searching for a place to fit in. You know what I mean? I think that I think that story is a really beautiful story. Um, I love those kind of characters, and those those are the stories that I'm that I'm shifting into now um, that I really enjoy telling. Did you ever see Toby Dammit, the uh, Roger Corman American Internationals picture? No, I've never seen that. that um, I was a, a freak for the um, Edgar Allan Poe movies of the '60s because that was my era. Okay. And um, Toby Dammit was a collection of three post stories brought together. So you can always segue your shorts if you think three or four of them would make a, a good, uh, you know, cohesive package. I'm just throwing that at you because... Oh, I think that's, I mean, I think that's really good. I mean, you know, I've made two shorts now and... Um, you know, I, I want to do another short. Um, I really want to try to get this pilot out and figure out what I want to do with it first. Um, what some of us think, some of my friends think you should turn it into a web series because, you know, the web is where all the content's going now. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to do another short. Um, I, and I, I am thinking of turning that chapter that I mentioned earlier into a short. But for right now, um, I, I like my, one of my friends said to me, who's a producer, he said, Eric, Always, you have your other project that you're talking about now, and you have your project that's out there. Just focus on those two. <laughs> and he's right, because I tend to take on like 10 projects at once. And remember this, Eric. The movie screen is larger than life, and it's magical. And I think people need to get away from the computer screens. They have a need to go to the theater. Yes, I totally agree, because I think the computer screen is, is taking away from life right now. So um, and you, I'm all about getting out of the house. So. Right. So you've got to create escapism for us to go to. Exactly. And, and for me to <laughs> no, critique. I'll keep creating, trust me. <laughs> and for me to critique. Um, we got to close this up in a couple of minutes. You were born in Malden? I was born in Malden, yes. I was born in Malden, and then I lived in Saugus, Massachusetts, until I was in the first grade. And then I grew up in Linfield, Massachusetts, and graduated from high school there. But I also, um, we have a, my parents have a summer house on Lake Wanapasaki in Alton Bay, New Hampshire, um, which I love and I go back to every year to see my nephew and my family and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's where I love to go. I love going to the lake. And where's that again? Uh, Alton Bay, New Hampshire on Lake Wanapasaki, right near so that's up New Hampshire and Guilford and all that. Is that up near Vermont? Um, it's, well, it's, no, not really. It's east of Vermont. Oh, um, okay. It's towards Portsmouth, about, I would say, about uh, half, uh, 45 minutes north of Portsmouth. Well, if you I come... I'm from Rochester. The reason I'm asking is if you come through Boston, come to the studio. Frank, Frank is going to call in. Oh, yeah, definitely. I would love to do that. Great. Um, because um, we have a film critic calling in right now, Frank Delistrito. Every Friday night he calls in. We play a public domain movie. Tonight's Night of the Living Dead. So this show's gone more movie than, than uh, I thought it initially, you know? That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and you know, we'd love to have you back. But right here in the studio, you've got to come in and spend a whole 55 minutes with us. Yeah, I would definitely. If I, you know, I'll be back sometime in August, and I will contact you and let you know. Um, I'm going to be writing to you about the Malden paper anyway. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Right, so I, I, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, thanks for being part of Visual Radio, and thank you for sending the film. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, Eric. Have a good night. S stay in touch, man. Bye-bye. Bye. That's Eric Casaccio and his movie Freak. The show is just... The show is just too short for me, Frank. Um, we've been plagued by the fax line, people. Plagued by the fax line. Um, 
And so we're going to talk about Night of the Living Dead. That was Frank Delistrito, and I will try to pull his number up right now. And we'll work out the bugs two weeks in a row, but that's okay. We've had a great show tonight, and it's just part of the process. It's just the universe seeing how patient I can be with my zillions of phone numbers in my Rolodex. It's ridiculous. I know it's ridiculous, but um, you know what? I was looking under Frank, and let's look under D. And here we go. Here we go. Aha! I got it. Two numbers. There we go. All right, I got it, I got it. Uh-oh, there we go, there we go. It's 8.50, we got five minutes, people. He might still be away. Please leave your name and message. I guess he's still away. So then we try the cell phone. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic... Well, Night of the Living Dead is our public domain movie tonight. And... Hello, Frank. Joe, how you doing? I've been trying to call you on the cell phone. Dylan. Is it the cell phone tonight? It's the cell phone, but... Hang up, I'll call you. Okay. This is, um, sorry people, sorry, that's showbiz, and I'm as patient as I can be about it, but there's nothing we can do. The uh, fax line ruined us tonight. I know, I know. Hey, you know, the fax line went off every single time, Anthony. Every single time tonight. And we got four minutes left, and we can't get an outside line. So, what can I say? I, pre I apologize, Frank. I've been, uh, we've been having this problem for two weeks now. Oh, and that's fine. I was talking about the movie. I don't know if it's Are you still in Galveston? No, I'm in, actually I'm in New Orleans now. Mardi Gras. All right, so Night of the Living Dead. I got this 25th anniversary VHS in front of me. I am, I am shocked that is in the public domain, but I guess it is if you're showing it. Well, it's not the 25th anniversary isn't. We're showing the original print, which is in the public okay. domain. Oh, yeah, it's, it's been uh, available. Uh, George Romero just didn't copyright it or something. Okay, God bless. And he's, he's still with us and still making movies. I think, I think cinematically, the best movie he has Monkey Shine, but this is his classic because this book called The Rules was a big hit. And what I love about this movie is if you're in the mood, mood to laugh at a horror movie, you can laugh at this one, but if you're in the mood to be scared, this one will scare you as few movies do. It truly is grisly. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's uh, well, I I remember seeing it in the theater when it came out. It came out in '68. I didn't see it in its first weeks. It kind of I kind of wait for it to work its way to me. But the audience was just mesmerized at a the effectiveness of the storytelling, the filmmaking, all that, and the black and white, and the black and white, and the, and B we were mesmerized by God how gorgeous this from it gets. I, they know that they broke the rules on, on gore, and um, at least uh, you know, above, above the table gore. They got those books going on in the underground. And, and uh, wow, how much more are they going to do this? Because this, you know, uh, you, you said this, had a, this is a movie made with very little money, so those, those uh, internal organs you're looking at every now and then are real. <laughs> so they're cheaper than fake. Oh, I think oh, that he got him out of a butcher shop. Who knows? But um, no, no. I, he, oh, I, I was actually at a forum in, in 1969 that uh, that George Morrow, Morrow gave, Romero gave, and one of the he, one of the questions he got was, "Where did those cops that he said he said the street trade farmer backers was a was a meat packer?" Well, um, you know, man, one man 
One guy throws in a dumpster, the other guy is making a movie out of it. Wow. So, hey, f- will you be back home next week, Frank? Next, back, I'll be back home next week, so hopefully our technical problems will be behind us. Yeah, because on both ends it's been, uh, it, you know, it's been rough. But this is a fun movie. It's a fun movie. It's a black and white horror fest. Don't you?